Thanks for stopping by to check out this episode of Vintage Audio Review where I talk about the Mark Levinson number 28 preamplifier. In 1991 it sold for $3,300 with a phono stage or $3,000 without a phono stage which would be about $7,400 with the phono stage today which would be in August of 2023. So as you would expect from something with the Mark Levinson logo on it, it was an expensive preamplifier. It's fairly heavy and well built as you'll see once we take the cover off and it's a Mark Levinson product. Now this is the first piece of Mark Levinson gear I have tested and right off the bat I am not a fan. Just reading, just reading from their owner's manual in regards to specifications and I'm just going to read it the correlation between published specifications and sonic quality is unreliable. A list of numbers reveals virtually nothing. All technical measurements must be subject to qualitative as well as quantitative interpretation. Measurements of the number 28 yield excellent results by any standards. However, only those specifications that apply to its actual operation are included here. And Basically, it gives you the dimensions, the weight, the voltages, and it has something about the gain for the different moving magnet stages, as well as some output impedance and that kind of thing. There's nothing about frequency response or THD or that. Now, measurements are not everything, but they certainly are an indicator of certain things. And I think that just by not including it and kind of going, oh, it's not really that important. Uh, I don't like that, so that's just my own thing. Also, you will see on the, the when we go to the back of it and look at the connectors, I don't know what they're thinking with their um, KMAC connector thing. Anyway, I'll talk about that when we get to the back of it. But this was, as I said, the first piece of Mark Levinson gear that I have tested. There is an amplifier that I'm going to test eventually. Great big uh, power amplifier there. Anyway, it's well built and you'll see all that once I pop the cover and go on with the tour and then I'll talk about the measurements and what I thought of its sound. Here is a front view of the Mark Levinson number 28 and we'll start on the right with their output level control which most people would call volume control. Now it does have an off position and when you move it to the off position it actually makes contact with a little micro switch and totally kills anything from going to the output of the preamplifier. We have a record selector and it has an input monitor and defeat position. In the defeat position it removes any output going to the tape monitor circuit. It also has a monitor selector here so you can have two tape uh, monitor loops. And then we have our input selector, which has auxiliary one and two, and a phono or an optional auxiliary, a CD, a tuner, and then two tape inputs. Now, the phono input does have the ability, once the cover is removed, to change the loadings for your phono cartridge. And it also can be set to either high gain or uh, low gain state, depending on whether you're using a moving magnet or moving coil cartridge. So it does have quite a bit of capability as far as hooking up to different phono cartridges. And I should point out that you can also set the amount of gain that the preamp has through a couple of dip switches and you'll see that when the cover is removed. And the owner's manual explains what position corresponds to what gain. This is the power supply. It's called a PLS-228 and I should point out it does have an LED on it when power is on and the preamp also has an LED that comes on when the power is on. Now you cannot switch it on or off. The power is always on on this unit. The power supply can't be switched on and off and the preamplifier cannot be switched on and off. So that's kind of a negative. I don't believe in leaving things on all the time but that's the way they did it. Here is the back of the power supply and this is where your IEC uh, AC power cord would plug into and this end right here 
Uh, I don't know how well it's going to come out. This guy right here is the connector that plugs into the back of the preamplifier itself. This obviously is the rear of the number 28 preamp. Starting on the left, we have our uh, balanced outputs for left and right channel. We also have outputs, and these are the infamous KMAC connectors, and that's spelled C-A-M-A-C, I believe. So we have some outputs right here for the main output, and then we have two tape outputs there. We also have our power supply input there. And we have inputs here. These are balanced XLR inputs for CD and the auxiliary two. And then we have the stupid KMAC connectors for the other inputs, which would be uh, your two tapes, an auxiliary, a tuner, and then your phono or auxiliary. And this guy right here is a grounding lug. So this is what the inside of the Mark Levinson number 28 preamp looks like with the cover removed. And it is without a doubt the most complicated preamp that I have ever run across. A quick little tour. This area right here is for the phono section and this dip switch and this dip switch are for different loading configurations. And there's a dip switch over here and a dip switch over here that set the gain, I would imagine, for the moving magnet or moving coil phono cartridge that you may have. So this little dip switch sets the gain of the line stage of the preamp, and there's a couple different amounts of gain. Here is our volume control pot, or they call it a output level pot right here, and it doesn't look like a normal pot with the ribbon cable. Um, I'm not really sure uh, exactly what kind of pot it is. Uh, there's no schematics that I could get on this thing, but it is very well constructed with a lot of interesting uh, audiophile parts in it. And we even have a microprocessor right here, it looks like. There's a or an FPGA, and we have some other programmed chips there just to make it even more complicated. This would not be something I would ever attempt to to try to work on. There's just so much stuff going on and heaven forbid if it breaks. Here is a little different view of the number 28 preamp. The input and output connections are all here and this board and this board plug into each other. And you can kind of see down here too where the front uh, control selectors are, how the boards kind of plug into each other there. So this is kind of just a general tour of it. Like I said, it would be a real pain in the butt to work on, in my opinion. Right now we're looking at the frequency response of the number 28 amplifier from 10 hertz to 40 kilohertz with a 6 dBV or 2 volt signal going in to the preamplifier and the output level or volume control as I referred to it earlier is set to give us zero dB gain. So two volt in, two volt out. And you can tell that the channels are balanced to within a tenth of a dB. At 10 hertz, our worst case loss is about, oh, we'll call it uh, four tenths of a dB. And if we go to 40 kilohertz, our gain is up about seven tenths of a dB or so down here. If you look the more traditional frequency range from 20 hertz, at 20 hertz we're down, oh, maybe two tenths of a dB here, and then at 20 kilohertz right here, we're up maybe, oh, two tenths of a dB. So it's fairly good uh, flatness as far as that is concerned. And I should point out that I'm using the CD balanced inputs. However, I do have an XLR to RCA input, so it's really an unbalanced measurement as well at the output. And at the preamplifier output, I'm using a unbalanced XLR to RCA adapter. So this is basically the unbalanced performance of the number 28 preamplifier. Here we have our standard THD SNR plot at one kilohertz with a 2 volt signal going into the number 28 preamplifier and a 2 volt signal coming out, pretty much that. The output level control, as it's called on this preamplifier, or the volume control as I would refer to it as, is set to give about 0 dB gain, you can see. And that equates to about 5.5 on the output level control on the preamplifier with the gain settings that I have set internally for this 
preamplifier. I should point out that I'm using the CD input and it is a balanced input which I am using in an unbalanced mode through the use of an XLR to RCA adapter on both the left and right channels. And on the preamplifier output which is also balanced I am using it as an unbalanced output with a, another XLR to RCA adapter. You can see that we've got a pretty good THD. It's not the best I've seen, but it's less than 0.03%. Our SNR is looking really good at, we'll call it a minimum of 95 dB, and the THD plus noise is better than minus 71 dB. So overall, it looks pretty good. Just for grins, we'll see what the harmonics uh, look like. So here are the harmonics, and you can see that the third harmonic, the odd harmonic is just a bit higher than the even harmonic, which you would kind of expect, being that this is a solid state preamplifier. So right now I'm going to see how much voltage I can get out of the number 28 preamplifier. That will be using the CD input as an unbalanced input. And I'm going to go ahead and keep the signal level at 3 dBV, and I'll start turning up the gain and we'll just see about how much we can get out before our distortion gets up there. So we're at about 8 on the output level scale and our THD and SNRs are still looking pretty good. And if I go all the way to the max, which is 10. So here is the output level set to 10 and it's still looking really good. We've got uh, 100 dB SNR on the right channel and 96 on the left, and the THDs are less than 0.05%, we'll call it. And we're showing about 5.5 volts out. If I increase my input signal level a bit, we'll see what happens. So our input signal level is at 2 volts RMS going in, which would be 6 dBV, and we're still looking pretty good. Uh, we're showing about almost 12 dB of gain and we're at about 7.7 .7 volts or so out. We can still raise our input level a little bit more. And right about there we're starting to get distortion. So we're going to say that at 6 dBV in with the output level set to a maximum of 10 that's going to be about as much as we can expect out of this, which is still pretty good. We're getting over 7.5 volts output at uh, 1 kilohertz. And here is the number 28 response to the multitone test. And it looks pretty good. It's showing about 14 to 15 bits of distortion-free range. Here we have a plot of the crosstalk of the number 28 preamplifier and in this case I'm using the balanced CD input of course it's converted to an unbalanced input and you are looking at the leakage between the left to right channel or the right to left channel in this case in the right to left channel you would have a signal applied to the right channel and you're looking at the leakage from the right channel onto the left channel and you can see at the worst case at 20 kilohertz we are at 60 dB for the right to left case and we're at about 58 dB for the case where the signal is applied to the right channel and you're looking at the leakage to the left channel and at 20 kilohertz for a signal applied to the left channel and looking at what's coming out on the right channel from the left channel you're seeing about 68 dB so overall this is very good crosstalk performance here we have a plot showing the THD versus frequency for several different input signal levels. The output level or volume control is set still to give 0 dB gain and I'm using the CD input uh, as an unbalanced input and the output is also unbalanced. You can see at this end of the band here, probably at around 20 hertz, the THD goes up quite a bit. But once we get a little bit beyond 20 hertz, maybe 23 hertz or so, the THD looks uh, pretty good. Except for the left channel right here, it seems not to like a minus 3 dBV input. If we ignore that, then the rest of the THD is less than 1%, which 
is not great for a preamp. You would want the THD to be less than 0.01% or 0.02%, something like that. And it doesn't look too bad once we get down into this level. We have a little bump here. This would be the left channel at plus 3 dBV, and that's going up above 0.1%. Uh, but once we get into some of these other uh, input levels here over frequency, we are less than 0.1%. Now, all these traces here that are above 0.1% uh, are for the left channel. And the left channel, I noticed, had some intermittent uh, gain uh, noise situations going on. And I'll try to capture that, but I never did hear anything when I uh, listened to it as far as left channel noise. As you saw from the test data, the number 28 preamplifier is no slouch when it comes to measurements. I kind of get what Mark Levinson is saying about not having measurements, specification measurements that is, but every other manufacturer whose equipment I've looked up lists specifications other than you know real basic stuff like weight and dimensions and AC power requirements. So I think that's kind of a, a snooty thing to do in my opinion. Oh, we're Mark Levinson. It's going to sound good. That's that's fine, but I'd still like to see some, some data just because I'm a data nerd, I guess. As I stated earlier, I had to use the XLR to RCA adapter on the CD input in order to do measurements which were unbalanced. I did not have the ability to do a balanced measurement on this amplifier, so both the inputs and outputs were actually unbalanced measurements. Had I the KMAC adapter to RCA adapter, which why do you want to have a KMAC adapter that's expensive and hard to get, and yet ultimately you're probably going to go to RCA anyway. What's up with that? I don't know. I, I just it's a way to get more money out of you. I saw a set of KMAC adapters for this at USET on eBay for like fourteen hundred dollars. So it's just one of those dumb things in my opinion. It doesn't really buy you anything. Uh, other than, oh, i got to use special adapters to hook up this Mark Levinson preamplifier. Anyway, I wasn't able to test the phono stage as, as such. It would have been interesting to measure the phono stage, but that wasn't possible because I do not have the KMAC adapters. For my listening test, I connected the number 28 to my Bryson 2B-LP power amplifier, and that was connected to my Wilson Watt 3 Puppy 2 loudspeakers. I listened to a variety of music and it, it sounded good. It, it's quiet. Uh, it did a good job. I don't really have any complaints about the sound. I decided to AV it against my Carver C1 and depending on the music they would sound the same or other music the Levinson sounded a bit better. One of the test tracks I use is Diana Krall's Temptation. AVing the C1 and this they were pretty much the same. I didn't really hear any difference. Another test track I use is Pink Floyd's Time, and at the beginning with all the clocks and chimes and all that stuff going off, this thing sounded much better than the Carver C1. There was uh, just more detail and a little bit broader sound stage, uh, but you know, it's cost but four times the amount of the C1 back in its day, I'd imagine. Anyway, um, you know, it sounds good. I wouldn't want to own it because if it broke, it's got a lot of special stuff in there and uh, it's not an easy thing to work on and I, I just it would not be something that I would want to buy um, as an older preamp just because if it breaks you're probably going to have to send it back to them or find somebody that specializes in Levinson repair. There's probably not a lot of shops that, that do but it's just not an easy thing to, to troubleshoot and probably even get parts for something this old. So that's kind of my take on the Mark Levinson number 28 preamplifier. If you have any questions about audio equipment, that kind of thing, there is an email in the description below that you can send questions to. And if I get about 10 to 15 minutes worth of questions, I would do a question and answer video. So please email me some questions if you have them. And if you have not subscribed to the channel, please do so. That helps the channel grow. If you like the video, click the like button. I guess if you don't like the video, if you're Mark Levinson fanatic, just don't click anything. And once again, until next time, have a great day or night.